Pedro Ceballos. I am the Executive Director of College Break. I'm also the SLAM Principal Investigator. So I'm so excited to be here today to share with you the first annual SLAM Symposium. So let's give it a hand for our because the guys chickened out. <laughs> yep, the gentlemen chickened out. Before we get started, we gotta thank some really important people for being able to make this happen. First and foremost, Dr. Martin Gomez. <laughs> Dr. Gomez is the principal here at Santa Education Complex, and he's been a partner and uh, someone who really helped make this come together, so we're really excited to, to be here. Uh, I wanted to point out Dr. Tama Melendez. Dr. Melendez, where are you? All right. City's office. She's a director of workforce development and education, so we're really thrilled she can be here to support the hard work of SLAM. Oh, see, I was a teacher for many years, so I was like, thank you. So we have Dr. Melendez. We've got uh, uh, Cal State LA Dean Allen. Dean Allen is uh, the Dean of the School of Engineering, Science, and Technology. Did I get that right? Engineering, Computer Science, and Technology. Yes, so it's STEM field, which is really critical. In addition, next to her, we have Cal State LA Dean Bowman. Uh, Dean Bowman is our partner. He is the Dean, Interim Dean of the College of Science and Natural Science. He's our partner. He's been working closely with us, and we're so excited to have him here today. In addition, I want to briefly thank our board of directors from College Bridge for coming out here and supporting us. We really could do this without you. And just very briefly, I want to tell you a quick background of SLAM and how this all started. Like all great things, it all started with one person having one idea. One fall. And that person who I need to point out is Dr. Lynn Ceballos, my beautiful wife. Dr. Ceballos' dissertation focused on the academic remediation problem. And so she had an idea. She said, We gotta do something about it. So she went to the former dean, Dean Henderson, and told him about the problem. She recruited Dr. Kristen Webster, who's one of our co teachers. We have a big problem with our Cal State system and with our university system in general, which is the fact that a lot of our kids come from school underprepared. So she recruited Dr. Webster, they went to talk to Dean Henderson, and from there this idea grew. So Dean Henderson brought some resources, and then we met Mr. Robert Bosley, Santee teacher. And from there, I uh, met up with Dr. Gomez and some of the partnership uh, for Los Angeles school folks, and we were able to break, make this come together. So we're really, really excited. We're here really to learn about the problem of college access and persistence, but also to celebrate. And just so you know, at Cal State LA, the average uh, passing rate for Math 109, which is the class these uh, ladies and gentlemen took, is 65%. And uh, the goal for our grant is going to be to, back to reach 70%. Well, these slants within this cohort are reaching 76%. So let's hear from that. Really so we're very now, last but not least, you know, everything really requires funding. And this program really would not have gone off the ground without the generous support of the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. So please thank very vigorously Mr. Todd Penner. Mr. Penner is really a hero of South LA, and we're very glad to be here today. Okay, so today's uh, topic is on college access and success. You will see us all up there. You see that gentleman pointing to the Cal State LA sign? Yep. That's his suit. Where are you, He's not the working for him. So anyway, that was a really neat day. We went to Cal State LA we had our field trip, and the kids got really excited, and you had your staff class there, and it was really, really wonderful. Uh, today we're going to talk about the problem of college access and success for underrepresented students, specifically some of the benefits that are involved. So you're going to hear from four distinguished panelists. You're going to hear from Ms. Andrea Robles. And Ms. Robles uh, will talk to you about the benefits of a college degree. And just to give you a little background about her, she's been accepted into Cal State Fullerton, which is her top choice school. So good job, Andrea. Public State. So we're here from four of the universities. So we know she's going to college. We're excited about this, and she'll tell you more about it. So without further ado, please let me introduce you to Andrea Robles. I'll be the first person, the first 
yeah, there's an inline family to go to college and earn a degree, so that's a pretty big deal, so I'm excited. So, earning a college degree, you're more aware of what's going on in your environment, what's going on in the world, so you'll most likely be able to go vote. You'll be more trying to get back to your community, so you'll be more involved in community service and person and then earn smart things like donating blood. So, yeah. Um, Decrease in crime. So, earning a college degree not only obviously helps you with two points already said, but you will be more educated and you have a good paying job, so that just, you have no need to like go and cause uh, chaos and crimes and stuff, so you'll be fine. You don't have to go wrong thing. <laughs> um, lower health care costs. So again, higher education, you'll have insurance and stuff, and so if you get sick or someone in your family gets sick, you don't have to go rush to the ER and pay loads of money should be paid, and you should save money. Uh, economic success, success. So that's just basically, um, uh, you'll just basically be more set for life, just overall. So if you will only earn a high school degree, you'll be earning around $1.3 million throughout your life. But just with the college degree, you'll be earning 2.7 million. That's twice the money just to earn a college degree. So that would be a pretty big deal. Um, degree attainment by sorry, degree attainment total by ethnicity. So as you can see, um, minorities are not at the highest compared to white Asians or Asians. We're kind of in the lower upper range. So that's not good. That's why we're here. We're trying to make, we're trying to change that. We're trying to be at the top. Um, oh. The slide that I just passed is just, um, it's college graduation rates in six years. So basically, African Americans are around 40%. You can see uh, American Indians are also around 40%. Latinos are 50%. Whites are around 60%. And Asians are more than 60, almost 70%. So basically, that means that on average, the time that you should be getting your bachelor's should be around four years. And if you exceed that, uh, obviously, the normally the people who exceed that time, those four years, are the ones who have to take education classes. Because basically, if you do not test according to the college level uh, English or math class you should be at, um, it will be longer in college and have to pay more, and you don't want that. Um, Unemployment rate in 2012. So basically, here it says that if you only earn a college degree, you'll be most likely to be underemployed based on the statistics in of 2012. If you only have a bachelor's or any other type of degree, you'll most likely be employed and less likely to be unemployed. Um, Median weekly earning, earning, sorry. Um, so if you only have a high school diploma, you'll be earning less compared to only having a bachelor's, doctor's, doctorate degree. Master's or associates earning just any degree, so you're earning less money in a week, opposed to just having a uh, high school degree. Um, lifetime earnings by vacation attainment. So basically, again, the you'll earn more money just by having a bachelor's degree opposed to just having a high school degree. I mean, yeah, you'll be making money, but you could be earning twice as much just by having a bachelor's degree. So. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Robles. So Ms. Robles talked about the benefits of a college degree. A lot of them are financial, but it's not all about the money. She also talked about graduating from college. Just so you know, Ms. Joaquin has been accepted to Humboldt State, Sonoma State, the Channel, uh, CSU Channel Islands, 
uh, Cal State Fullerton, University of California Riverside, which is Dr. Gomez's story, Dr. Gomez. <laughs> and she's still waiting here on four more. So that's a lot. She is batting thousands. She has not had a single rejection letter, but she does get a single rejection letter. So we're really going to talk to her. She also has a very high uh, average GPA for a uh, percent. And she, what was your grade? <laughs> Congratulations. Well done. Please help me welcome Ms. Joaquin. school and you're a college counselor, you have approximately 500 students in your case. Okay, you know, 500 students with a year, you can meet with them, you can talk with them, you can counsel them, coach them, all that. If you're in a, a, at a low income school, it's going to be closer to uh, 1100, it's 10, 1056, correct? 
1056. So that's twice as much on your caseload. So you don't have the time to give those kids the individualized attention to really get to know them, find out what they need, and help them get into college. So that's uh, something very important. Our next esteemed panelist is Ms. Wendy Hernandez. Ms. Hernandez is going to discuss to you college affordability and uh, student loans and all those different things. Things are still paid to this day. And I think most of us are more involved, but it's definitely worth the investment. That's why we're here. Ms. Hernandez has been accepted to Cal State Dominguez Hills, and she's waiting here for seven schools. She is also on uh, the questionnaire for UC Davis. Uh, so that's a good sign, it means that we're still interested in looking at her. She has plans of becoming a veterinarian. I don't know if you know this or not, but there's only eight veterinary schools in the United States. Eight. And it's a lot harder to go to medical school because you're not just learning one species, you're learning many different species. So she has a long road ahead of her, but we wish her luck, and she'll earn a good living if she's a veterinarian. Please welcome Ms. Hernandez. It's free money. There is scholarships, which is also free money. However, it's based on two things. It's need-based, which is like for the low-income families. And there is also a word-based, which is like for those people who have a special talent, such as like the music, sport, all of that. Another financial aid is work-study, where you basically work to pay for your college, which is a pretty good thing too. And the last type of financial aid is some good thing that nobody really wants, but most likely we have to get, which is loans. And from what I heard, it may take forever to pay them. If it were harder, but if it wasn't for this financial aid, most of us wouldn't even go to college. So um, I know that for a fact because my mom, she works a lot, a whole a lot. And even if no matter how much she works, she probably still wouldn't be able to afford it. And then I know that I would have to like maybe you know, go to college for the first year, so I would have to probably get a job for like three years before I even go to college. And by that time, I could have been graduated from college, so that's why I think financial is pretty good. Um, my second point is I'm going to say is the lack of access to information about financial aid. Basically, you cannot teach what you don't know. What I'm trying to say is that our parents, most of our parents didn't even go to college, so how are they gonna help us prepare to apply for financial aid? How are they gonna know about the house? How, how are they gonna help us? So the lack of information sometimes is an obstacle for us. My third point is financial aid award. It's a strong predictor of students' ability to enroll in and graduate from college. This is an obvious one. The more financial aid, the more money we have to get the classes that we actually need to graduate. And 
My last point is, there is the direct correlation between help in completing the free application for student aid and college and matriculation. A research says that if you are underrepresented as a student, you will get help with the financial, with the FAUSA, you, you are most likely to matriculate. Um, on Saturday, the college bridge will help, will be assisting students from the district, and it's going to help us with the FAUSA. And I will be there with my parents. Now I'm going to be showing you some charts. The first one is about how to issue and grow dramatically outspace family income growth. And as you can see, you can see how the family income grew by to like 10% and how the private tuition is 154% and the public tuition is 186 The third slide. The third slide is about, it's about the real tuition, fee, rooms, and board costs, the average for your public and private institution. As you see, it keeps increasing every year, and privates are more expensive than public. Um, the fourth chart is about the student loan exposure. College tuition went up 300% since 1990, which is the biggest growth between healthcare, energy, and housing. And the fifth chart is what everybody should look at at a college. When you look at a college, it should be affordable and desirable. That's the main part. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Fernandez. Uh, Mr. Harris talked about college affordability, which is a huge issue. And you know, you probably see in the news a lot where people talk about, about you know, there's all these people that say you shouldn't go to college and, and there's some entrepreneurs that will give you money not to go to college. One thing I always think about is, is that good enough for your kids? And most people that say not to go to college, if you're asking them, would you want that for your kids? They're never going to agree. So that's something really important. And a lot of people who say, oh, you know, college is too expensive, don't do it. It's for other people's kids, but never for their own. So that's an important point. Last but not least, our last panelist, esteemed panelist, is Ms. Leah Arrueta. Thank you. Uh, now, Mr. Arrueta will be discussing with you the, one of the core issues of SLAM, which is academic remediation. The whole idea that we don't want students to start behind when they first are college. Now, remember when we talked about the 76% pass rate, that's really important because that means that 76% of our students will never have to be in the remediation path. Because of the agreement with Cal State LA, and because since they passed this course, and Cal State LA is a WASP accredited school, they can transfer that credit to any school in the country, private, public, doesn't matter. Also, if they choose to stay at Cal State, at any of the 23 campuses, they will never have to be in the remediation sequence because they've already earned college level credit. So it's a big deal. Without further ado, please give your attention to Ms. Arueta. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Thank you. Ms. Arueta has been accepted to CSUN, the California State University of Northridge. She's been accepted to Cal State Fullerton, Chico State, and she's waiting to hear for one more. So she is also batting a thousand. You have not got any rejection from her, second. Nor do we want any. So good job, Ms. Arueta. She is really, really good. Thank you for coming. Hi, my <laughs> Okay, I'm going to talk about academic remediation, which is when students arrive to school underprepared, which is not good. Academic remediation is a major factor hindering, hindering students' persistence in college, which means you're not going to be progressing if you get remediation classes. 1.7 million nationwide students are placed in remediation classes every year. Isn't that crazy? Um, the CSU spends $30 million every year for remediation classes. The cost of the U.S. is $3 billion a year. It harms 
students a lot because they fall into debt and then they spend more time in college which delays their entrance into the workforce. It harms society because it lowers their income tax revenues and they have unskilled workforce. So for example, if you want to be a nurse and you didn't get a, a college degree, it's going to hurt you badly because you didn't get that degree, so you won't go, you, you won't go pretty far. There are some ways to avoid getting remediation classes. For example, getting credit, college credit in high school, like AP classes, which is advanced business classes, and this SLAM program. I I got relieved with this remediation. I won't be able, I won't be going to remediation classes for math because I took this class. So this was a big relief for me because now I'm going to start at a college level math class instead of starting from the beginning. You could also score higher SAT or ACT scores, which will prevent you from from getting remediation classes and. When you go to college, you, you take a placement test, and if you don't you don't pass it, you're gonna get remediation classes. If they don't, for example, if, if a student doesn't pass geometry in that placement test, they don't get into a, a regular geometry class, but they go they fall even lower in the in the in the math in a math class, and that'll take up their time, and they, they won't be progressing, and they're gonna take a really long time to graduate to graduate. Um, less than 10% of students nationwide will graduate from community college in three years, and a little more than a third will graduate in six years for their bachelor's degree. The EAP, which is a, 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 a little 15 question test that juniors get in the year for in their CST school, in their CSTs, determine whether you will or will not get remediation classes. So that is very important because people don't really pay attention to it, but they really should. They really should because that determines if they're going to start at a lower, at a lower math class or they're going to go into a college level. So in Casa de Ley, these are the students that need remediation classes. African Americans, there are like 70%, American Indian, a little bit more than 30%, Latinos, around 65%, whites, 40%, and Asians, 20%. So that's pretty bad because some of them really need these classes and it's not, it's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alberta. Now, the students did a great job in terms of their study and preparation in the class, but an important factor in student achievement is always the teacher. In fact, if you, you know, the educational research says that the strongest predictor of student achievement is the quality of the teachers you have. And these ladies and gentlemen from SLAM had excellent quality teachers. So I want to, first of all, congratulate and thank Dr. Kristen Webster and Ms. Dr. Bobby. What I want to do is I want to bring them up so they can tell you their background for SLAM, how they got involved, and some of the best practices they're seeing emerge from this program. So let's start with Dr. Webster. Students who 
end up having to take remedial courses. So since we're on the quarter system, many students entering start having needing three remedial math classes before they can take their college level math class. So that means four quarters of math before they complete their college requirements. So as many as four, which is expensive, it's time consuming, and um, our individual class rate or our individual classes, sorry, are only have about a 70% pass rate. So in our remedial program, our math classes, we're still, many students repeat the classes more than once. So that just kind of adds to the expense, the time, and all these things. So from all this, um, when I met uh, Lynn, that I, and she was so involved in kind of these uh, partnerships between colleges and high schools, I knew I wanted to get involved um, with this project. Because I want, I want there to be more solutions for our high school students. I don't want to see as many students ending up in the uh, remedial math classes. Um, so for me, this was an amazing experience. I think the students in the class, uh, I think just the change that I saw over in their performance over one semester's time was amazing. Their first assignment that they handed in to me, after I graded it, I went to Dean Henderson and I basically made like the cringing face and was like, I don't know about this. But uh, I had to with Mr. Bosley and the students really stepped up. I mean, things went in a totally different direction by the end. I had students kind of doing work at a level that I didn't think was possible based on that first assignment. So I am so proud of their pass rate um, and the quality that I got. So, so as far as best, best practices were concerned, it was very important to me that this, is, this project is not seen as an advanced placement replacement. So this is not supposed to be an AP course. Um, we, we know that the students that get caught in remediation are not you know, those top students that you would normally see also successful on the AP program. We really wanted to target that population of students that we know when they come to Cal State LA, they don't test that well in the ELM or they don't have SAT scores high enough and they get placed into those classes. So this population is our target population. We don't really want the best and brightest math students. We want those students that are going to get stuck taking course after course after course to get one college level credit class. Um, the second thing is that the curriculum that I taught here is exactly the same curriculum that we use at Cal State LA. So um, they are pretty much lesson by lesson getting the same course. So it is not only um, a statistics is an extremely useful math class in most careers, but it also kind of gives them a taste of that college experience. Um, so, you know, the benefits are, I mean, I could talk for a long time, but <laughs> I will turn it over to Mr. Bosley. So. Good morning. Um, I'd first like to welcome everyone to um, the Santee Education Complex. Uh, I have been one of the math professors here, or math teachers here, since the school opened, so I'm very proud of the school, and I'm thrilled to have so many distinguished guests um, join us. Um, like I said, I, I have been teaching here since 2005 when the school opened, and all the problems that um, my students and the panelists were talking about with the underrepresentation, with the difficulty that our students from communities and populations like this have, I've seen firsthand. Uh, I've seen my students struggle. I've seen some of my best and brightest students, you know, finally think they they reached it. They they got through high school. They've got those uh, acceptance letters. They've got into colleges, and then still end up finding out that they have to go and take all these uh, remedial classes, and they end up falling out that first year. I've seen this year after year after year. And I mean, as, as a teacher, as someone who cares deeply about his students, I, I hated it. I hated seeing our students, you know, get finally get to college just to end up dropping out their first year. And the largest reason for that dropout was having to take remedial courses. So when um, I was first introduced to um, the members of the SLAM team, and um, Dr. Gomez brought this to my attention, and, asked if I wanted to be part of it. I was like, oh my god, of course I did. I was extremely excited about being part of this. 
after a semester of doing all the hard work and knowing how much work we still have to do in front of us, I'm even more excited now. And I'm, I'm more excited because I've seen what my students have been able to do. Some of these students, this was my first year with them. Some of these students, I've had this is my third year with them. So, so I've known some of these students, but I've seen them grow. And I've seen how fast they've grown in one semester. I remember one of the very first um, days that Dr. Webster was lecturing, and I mean, she might as well have been up there talking in Greek, because our students are just kind of sitting there looking at each other, and like, you don't know what, she, what she's asking. That grew from, by the end of the semester, um, Dr. Pedro came in one day to do, a, to do um, an exit survey for some of our data. He brought in donuts. <laughs> you know, which you preaching those the questions love. And half the class immediately said, wait a second, are, are we creating bias because you're making us happy by bringing the donuts in first? <laughs> and I, I, I just looked it up, you know, we looked at each other and we're like, yes, the, we've done it. The students, they've become, you know, critical consumers of data. They've gotten this uh, quantitative reasoning and abstract um, logic that we wanted them to get out of this class. So we were, you know, the work that my students have put in, I, I can't explain how proud I am of them. Um, and I do, I want to take a moment to recognize not just the four ladies up on the panelists, but all of my students that are out there. <laughs> I'm definitely thrilled to be part of this, and I'm excited for the challenges that the next year bring as we try to expand this throughout. So we're not just serving students at St. T, but we're serving students in the community and students in, with populations that are similar to, to ours that face the same issues year in and year out that we do. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you guys for your time. Uh, I'll turn this back over to Dr. <laughs> Been really a pleasure to have you here. I'd like to close um, with some pictures of the students because really everything we do is student center. And so you see some of the kids up there. That was also at Cal State LA. They had a great time. I just really loved it. We have some of our students there. And then we had to do a meeting, a serious picture, or here's a silly picture. So we have silly picture face. Ah, next one. Sorry, <laughs> he's outside. I also wanted to add a little, little joke. <laughs> right? Statistics were like a bikini. But they reveal his suggestion, or they can steal his bio. So I... That's the appropriate picture I could find. I was just like, wow. That's the appropriate picture I could find, but I didn't want to end with a joke. And I also just wanted to go ahead and thank you. Thank you so much for being here and celebrating our student success. And I also wanted to ask you, open it up for any Q&A, any questions or answers. Now is the time if you want to ask the students or ask anything about the program. So any questions, raise your hand and I'll give you the mic if you like.
it's just surprising that I was able to report in the class. But I mean, I think it was a good experience and I definitely learned a lot from being there. I think my math skills certainly got better. So that's good. Dr. Jaffe, let me see if you can project. Okay. Oh, I have two questions. One is, so this is a stats class without an algebra two prerequisite, and is, um, which I understand all of the CSUs are not accepting, but it's your class, so a comment about that. And also, what sort of additional, if that's right, and what sort of additional support did you provide the students so that they were able to be successful in the, in the college class? <laughs> Okay, so first of all, there is there was a math <laughs> So, um, so I yeah, said, yeah, I yeah, I but not college. No, no. Um, so, as far as that, that's concerned, this is where the co-teaching became um, kind of an essential part of the class. And the way we can split up the week is, um, I would lecture, you know, three hours a week, basically. And then the other two hours a week, um, Mr. Bobby would hold like a reputation section, a workshop section, and the students could ask him questions more freely, they could work on homework problems, do a lot of examples. Um, he, you know, would definitely take, you know, go back go back to the test and see which parts they were kind of missing and review those, those concepts. And so the, the team was kind of essential to that, to the success. So it was definitely, and we uh, at Cal State are actually moving to that workshop format for many of our classes. Um, because it does tend to enhance student success. And, and I also think that that model um, gives the students some experience with um, being with the college um, in a college class with the, the type of lectures because it, I mean, a victim of remediation and so I'm just really happy to be here and to see um, educational professors and teachers do this for students and I really hope that this spreads because it is a major um, problem in our community so I just want to commend the students for getting to this place and I just want to wish you luck on your AP statistics class and um, if um, Hopefully, you know, I'll be doing um, college um, advising, so, you know, you can always come to me and I'll be free for that. So I just want to congratulate everybody here that has been a part of the SNAP project. I want to thank you for having the microphone, if you get to say what you want to say. Ms. Jasmine Ortega, welcome. Please welcome Ms. Jasmine Ortega. She is, oh, yes, I'm sorry, but you've been here. Who is this guy? Never mind. Any other questions for our SLAM panelists or for the professor of the future? Yes, Dr. B. Um, I had a question for the instructors. What was the most critical piece of practical advice that, you know, you, you know the research, you know the theory, but if you were to go back in time and kind of talk about the practical real world lessons that you learned the hard way that were essential to success, what would those be? <laughs> Um, for our um, relationship and teaching advice, I think one of the things that was essential uh, is the time before the class, the, the PD before the class, to um, get to know each other, to get to figure out how we were going to um, divide up the class, how we were going to do this co teaching model. Because I don't think you've never done it before. And neither one of you had done the co teaching model before. So I think that was um, something I know if we could have gone back looking back and any advice I would give to uh, other teachers as, it, as this expands in other schools is that time is, is essential. Um, I, I think we both agree we'd like to go back and actually add a little bit more time to, to plan that because we kind of made this model up as we went because we didn't um, take as much time for the planning beforehand. So I think that that's essential and that's one of the things that I would have changed um, looking back at it. <laughs> one other thing along those lines is uh, what we found that changed over the semester was also just the student behavior, kind of that stepping up and taking responsibility. 
And so I would love to have incorporated more um, of those, the, you know, just discussions about those sorts of things. And what, what are college behaviors? What's the difference between what a professor expects in college versus what your teacher in high school expects? You know, I feel like some of that surprises me. You know, I'm not going to chase you down to you know, make up a test or hand in a homework. I just you know, let them take the Yes, Dr. Gorman. So, for, for the students, because uh, like Mr. Bosley said, this does require a lot of resources from the Dow Foundation and from Santi and from LAUSD. Uh, but I, I just wanted to hear uh, now that you've, uh, 22 of you have taken and passed the college level class with the college level professor writing all crazy on the board. Uh, <laughs> How much more confident are you for next year when you all attend UC Riverside? Well, I think they're done. Okay. And we need to think about college and so we like saying how we're more, we're going to have to be more responsible individually, we're going to have to be more responsible, we're going to have to look for our own resources more often than attending to others. However, they can help a lot.
Um, yeah, it's really different because, um, well, for this class, it, it was really necessary, necessary for us to have groups because we feel more confident with each other and then it's like we learn better in a way. That's it, like it's, it's better. I just think I'm going to be a really kind person. I don't know what you guys are all scared. There's something that makes me scared because she's not scared. She's a really good person. Any other questions for our team panelists? What's next for the program? Good point. Okay, so immediately for these classes, the 29 students in Sinai right now, next semester they're enrolled in AP Statistics. So those that did not earn credit first semester have a second opportunity to earn credit. These ladies and gentlemen that did earn uh, credit, or I passed the math 109, have another opportunity to earn a second math credit. So at least this will become their statistics class, and math 109 will become their quantitative reasoning. So if these guys and gals do it correctly, they can graduate from high school with two math classes. If they want to be a math major, they're on their way. If they despise math, they never look at it again. So it's, yeah, that's what's next. In terms of the SLAM project, year two, we're moving to Wilson High School. And so, we're, so um, Dr. Rucker will be co-teaching with a teacher at Wilson High School. Mr. Bobby will be co-teaching with a colleague here at Santee. And then year three, Mr. Bobby will be teaching alone, so we can test the, the differences in the model. Dr. Webster will be co-teaching with another uh, LUC teacher at the third school that we haven't located yet. And then the teacher that she's teach, will teach with next year at Wilson will co-teach with one of her colleagues. So it's scaling up like that. Good question. Yes? That's a really good question. Do we have any plans to do something with the algebra tree or the chocolate sequence? Um, with partners like you, you know, yes, we would love to do something like that because engineering requires a lot of help. And one of the things that they tell you is that when we went to the Cal State LA, um, the Savannah students really love the Solar Eagle project. And those of you that don't know the Solar Eagle project is an amazing project. And what they do is the engineering department creates a solar powered car. And they've been doing this for like a decade, right? A little over a decade. Okay, but they did, they were very successful. So if we will do something on it, then you're a picture friend. Yes, Dr. Melendez. Just a quick question. Um, what are the plans uh, for integrated math with the final four? I don't know if you know. Very good question. So some of the work that Mr. Bosley, Dr. Webster, and Holly are doing is we've we'll been correlating math 109 to AP statistics to the common core. Actually, I'm not a mathematician, so let me, let me give you the answer. Um, we did want to look at a 
group of students that typically do have to do the intervention. So we didn't um, we didn't want our you know top math students. So please, any of my students, don't think I'm insulting you. But, um, we we didn't want to take away from our AP stats, our I'm sorry, our AP Cal program either. So we didn't take any of our students that uh, should have been in the AP uh, Cal program. Uh, we wanted to make sure that these students. Uh, we're going to be able to use the college credits immediately, so all of the students were seniors. Um, we actually went through a small interview process um, with most of the students to find what colleges they were actually interested in, because we did want students that were at least also, at least interested in looking at the Cal State, so we didn't you know, want, to, want to do this and then have all the students go to the private schools uh, after Cal State helped us out so much. Um, and then we looked at the GPAs. Because again, we didn't we didn't want the students that were you know likely not to get into college, but we also didn't want the students that were likely not to need the interventions. So we, we took you know we we went from I think from uh, two point three to like three point two was our my general range of GPAs. Uh, yeah, yeah. No uh, GPA period, but then we also did look specifically at the math. Uh, like I said, most of the students I know because I've, I've had many of them before. Others others came to me by recommendations from, uh, I leaned heavily on the AP uh, psychology teacher, AP psych teachers, uh, because there's so much uh, overlap between statistics and psychology. Uh, so the, those were, and then it was also, you know, recruitment. It was also, you know, which students were interested. So that was the first step, just going to some of the math classes, going to some of the other junior level classes last year, telling them about it, uh, and then having the ones that were interested come to us, and then from there we started to filter out, you know, based on all the other criteria that I mentioned. Any other questions? Excellent questions. Uh, share how many students dropped out? There is, there was only one student uh, that dropped out of the, the program, um, and, and it was actually a student that was originally misplaced anyways. Um, but it was a student that didn't drop out because of the course, dropped out because of the, the time of day. We did this class first period uh, for several reasons, and this student that dropped out uh, was just trying to get out of, uh, out of first period for family issues, so it, it wasn't, you know, we didn't lose the Loser because of the uh, material. Any other questions? Yes. Were the classes every day were held here at Santee? Yeah, every single day the classes were held at Santee. Tuesday to was Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Dr. Western lecture. Tuesday and Thursday, Mr. Fossey did the office hour, you know, kind of work. So yeah, good question. But they were all, all held here on campus. Except one. We had one class at Cal State where we took the students and we actually used the facility there. Any other questions? Yes, Susan. I'd like to hear from some of the parents, if they're here, about their experience as parents having their kids in this program, and uh, just in general, what do the parents think about it? Yes, sir. Who's your daughter? My daughter, Celeste Joaquin. Um, it's been a big help for her. I mean, you know, like I said, a lot of the people spoke to that um, I've never went to college were pushing for her and my son's 